Okay, good evening. Tonight we will be, be presenting a city-initiated urgency ordinance to establish objective designs, objective zoning design and subdivision standards in response to the new state law SB9. As a reminder, SB9 is a new housing law that promotes small-scale neighborhood residential development by creating a streamlined process for homeowners to create duplexes or subdivide their existing single-family zone property. Development using SB9 is ministerial and will not require a public hearing. Staff previously made a presentation to the Planning Commission on October 6th and City Council on October 25th providing an overview of the new state housing laws, including SB9, which was signed into law on September 16th, 2021. City Council directed staff to prepare an ordinance amendment to establish objective zoning, zoning design and subdivision standards for SB9 development. The draft ordinance was heard by the Planning Commission at its December 15th hearing. The Planning Commission provided comments and corrections to the ordinance and requested the draft ordinance return at a date uncertain for further review and discussion. In the supplemental packet distributed for tonight's meeting are the proposed edits from Planning Commission. In addition, the Planning Commission has asked staff to return with an explanation of the difference between SB9 and ADU laws. And finally, they have asked for further discussion of the proposed off-street parking requirements. For a property to be eligible for development using SB9, they must be located in an urbanized area in a single family zone outside a wildlife habitat area. Allowed zones for SB9 development are the open space, residential estate, residential very low, residential low, residential medium, and residential plan development zones. If a property is located in the very, very high fire hazard zone, flood zone, or Alquist Priolo fault zone, they must be designed to mitigate the effects of their hazards, such as meeting the fire code or determining a buildable area on the site. This exhibit shows the areas of the city where development could be impacted or restricted. The white striped line running along the northern edge of the city is the Alquist Priolo Fault Zone. The purple are the zones where um, residential is not permitted. The blue is the 100 year floodplain. Red is the very high fire hazard area, and the green are the wildlife corridors. The orange striped area that we see on the map are the portions of the city where SB9 development could be allowed. And special hazard areas are eligible for SB9 development, but they must meet a higher standard for safety and be reviewed by the directors of public works and environmental services. Additionally, an eligible property for development using SB9 cannot be an income restricted affordable unit that has been rented in the last three years. And only 25% of the exterior structure may be demolished in order to accommodate development. Two new terms were created for the urgency ordinance. The first term is a two unit residential development, which is defined as a development with no more than two residential units located on a single lot in a single family residential zone. The residential units may be located in a single building that contains two primary residential units, also known as, known as a duplex, or in two detached buildings. A two-unit residential tentative parcel map is also called an urban lot split in the new SB9 law, and the two terms are used inter interchangeably in the ordinance. A two-unit residential tentative parcel map creates no more than two parcels from an existing conforming parcel in a in a single family residential zone. Using the provisions of the two residential development, a lot could be, could be developed in one of four ways. A property developed with one single family residence could add one SB9 unit plus an ADU and a JADU. Access to the new SB9 unit would be a walking path to the unit's front door and parking would be in an enclosed garage. In this scenario, the property is not eligible for an urban lot split. A property developed with one single family residence could add one SB9 unit plus two ADUs. The two ADUs are possible in this scenario because with the addition of one SB9 unit, the property becomes a multifamily development and is eligible for two ADUs under state law. 
Access to the SB9 unit would be from a walking path to the unit's front door, and parking would be in an enclosed garage. In this scenario, the property is not eligible for an urban lot split. A property developed with one single family residence, an ADU and or a JADU, could add one SB9 unit. Access to the SB9 unit would be from a walking path to the unit's front door, and parking would be in an enclosed garage space. In this scenario, the property is not eligible for an urban lot split. A property developed with one single family residence can split the lot in half and add one SB9 unit to the lot with the main residence. Plus, they can add two SB9 units in the newly created lot. No additional units, including an ADU or JADU, may be added to either property. Parking would be provided in an enclosed garage located on the individual lots and access to the rear property would be from a new driveway. Unlike ADU laws, SB 9 allows cities to require enclosed garage parking. And garage parking may be in individual garages, shared side-by-side -side garages, or shared tandem garages. The new Senate bill gives cities specific requirements for two-unit residential development, but also gives cities flexibility to implement their own objective design standards as long as they don't restrict two 800-square-foot units from being constructed on the property. The state requires the rear and side yard setbacks be a four-foot maximum, and the state also restricts cities from requiring more than one parking space per unit unless the property is located within a half mile of a high-quality transit corridor where no parking could be, be required. In Simi Valley, the high-quality transit corridor would be the train station. The building official may deny, it, may deny SB9 development based on evidence that the development would have a specific adverse impact on public health and safety or physical environment in which there is no feasible method to satisfactorily mitigate or avoid the impact. And rental units must be for a term longer than 30 days, and if the property is divided using SB9, the property owner is required to live in a unit as the primary residence for a minimum of three years. The city's current transportation system does not meet the state's definition of a high-quality transit system except for the train station. This exhibit shows the half-mile buffer around the train station, which is the train station is outlined here in red, and then this dashed red line is the, um, the half-mile buffer, and then in red are the affected properties. And on these properties that are shown in red, these properties are not required to provide um, the one parking space. While SB9 regulates many development standards for the addition of new units and subdividing lots, it also gives cities the ability to adopt objective design standards to guide development on eligible properties. Objective design standards incorporated into the ordinance include unit sizes, building height, and building separation, open space, and landscaping, and parking. The SB9 law allows cities to implement objective development, design, and subdivision standards. In the proposed urgency ordinance, staff proposes objective development standards, which would allow larger units require enclosed parking development to follow the city's landscape and tree removal standards and define allowed site access, maximum building height, and building separation. City Council has the discretion to recommend modifications to these objective design standards as part of tonight's motion. The objective design standards contained in the urgency ordinance include the following standards. Maximum unit sizes are established by the size of the lot. This means that larger lots can have larger units. Lots up to 5,000 square feet may have a maximum of an 800 square foot unit. Lots between 5,000 and 8,000 square feet could have a 1,000 square foot unit. And lots over 8,000 square feet could have a unit up to 1,200 square feet in size. Building setbacks for the front and street side yards is determined by the individual zone requirements. Rear yard and side yard setbacks for an SB9 unit that's one story, maximum of 18 feet tall, is four feet. Units that are proposed over 18 feet in height up to a maximum of 30 feet or two stories and have a maximum, would have a maximum side yard setback of 10 feet. 
Two unit residential units, maybe two stories with an increased rear and side yard setback to meet minimum building separation. Buildings that are only single story are separated by a 10 foot minimum, while two story buildings are separated by a 20 foot minimum. Parking is required to be in an enclosed garage with a minimum of one parking space per unit. Two residential unit developments are permitted to have tandem parking to meet the minimum parking requirement. Subdivision of SB9 eligible properties is by a ministerial tentative parcel map that does not require a public hearing. A total of two lots may be created and a minimum lot size of 1,200 square feet is required. The lot split ratio must also be a minimum of a 40%, 60% split. To be eligible for an urban lot split, the original lot can have a maximum of two dwelling units. This would result in each lot having two units for a maximum of four units total. Finally, the urban lot split can only happen once and the owner cannot split adjacent properties. As shown here, lots may be split in many configurations. The lot may be split vertically or horizontally, shown here, or it can be a flag lot. If a lot is split, the minimum lot size must be at least a 40%, 60% lot ratio. Filing for a two unit development lot split is similar to other tentative parcel maps. However, processing is different in that maps for urban lot splits are approved ministerially. Conditions for dedication of right of way or construction of offsite improvements are not allowed. Moving forward, staff will return to the City Council on January, on January 24th to extend the urgency ordinance to December of 2022. During that time extension, staff will refine the proposed ordinance and return to the Planning Commission to further discuss the ordinance. And the ordinance will ultimately return to the City Council at a date uncertain for final approval. And staff recommends that the City Council approve the ordinance as, pre as presented. And that concludes staff presentation and we're available to answer any questions.